Welcome to the third in a series of televised debates between the candidates for the United States Senate. The debates are presented as a public service by the broadcasters of North Carolina. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lee Morris, Vice President of Carolina Broadcasting Company, and it is my pleasure to serve as moderator this evening for this live statewide one-hour debate between two of the candidates for the United States Senate. We want to thank radio and television stations throughout the state for making time available tonight for this public service broadcast. I am pleased at this time to introduce and welcome to Charlotte, first Mr. Jesse Helms, the Republican candidate, and Mr. Jim Hunt, the Democratic candidate. Before we begin, I'd like to explain the rules of the debate. Each candidate will make an opening statement. The order in which the statements are presented has been determined by the flip of a coin. Following the opening statements, I'll ask the candidates a total of six questions, three prepared by each candidate. Upon completion of that portion of the debate, the candidates will engage in a direct exchange of questions, answers, and rebuttals. The debate will conclude with closing statements from each candidate. The candidates have agreed on a specific amount of time to be allowed for statements, questions, answers, and rebuttals. And now, Mr. Helms, we'll begin the debate with your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I've listened carefully to the comments by Governor Hunt during the first two debates, and his message in this campaign is clear. His solution to everything is more government and more taxes. Like Walter Mondale, the governor would return America to the tax and spend policies of the past. It won't work, it has never worked, and it never will. I'm proud to have supported President Reagan's economic policies. Now, these policies have already, already produced an economic miracle in America. Seven million new jobs, lower inflation, and lower interest rates. There's an upbeat, cheerful attitude about the future of America today, a feeling of national pride exceeding anything we've seen in years. But the governor has repeatedly and harshly criticized President Reagan's economic policies. He's called them a failure. In fact, Mr. Hunt stated, and I quote him, every day that Ronald Reagan serves as President of the United States, I think Jimmy Carter looks better and better, end of quote. Now there, ladies and gentlemen, is the fundamental difference between the governor and me. He advocates the failed policies of the Carter Mondale years, and I want to continue the policies of Ronald Reagan. Now, Mr. Mondale and Mr. Hunt would reverse the economic upswing in America by piling billions of more spending and taxes on the backs of the hardworking Americans. Earlier this year, we saw the governor hold up his hand at the National Governors Conference in Washington and approve a $217 billion tax increase on the working people of America, more than $2,500 in additional taxes on the average North Carolina family. Yet, astonishingly, he now denies that he favors a tax increase. Ladies and gentlemen, I will continue to oppose a tax increase. So the choice in this Senate race is clear. I'll reiterate what I've said before. I'm a Reagan conservative and proud of it, and Mr. Hunt is a Mondale liberal and ashamed of it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And now the opening statement of Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. When I first sought public office 12 years ago, it was because of my deeply held conviction that state government ought to serve all of the people, not just the powerful and the privileged. I'm challenging Senator Helms for the same reason, and I might remind him tonight that he's running against me for the Senate, not against Walter Mondale. I believe it's time that North Carolina had a senator who fights for people and for progress. I believe in positive and progressive leadership, the kind of leadership that has moved North Carolina forward and helps us face the future with confidence and with hope. I reject the kind of leadership that pits white against black, rich against poor, old against young, the kind that speaks to our prejudices and our fears and tries to drag us back. Now, in our last debate, I challenged Senator Helms to put aside all of his negativism and tell us what he is for 
not just what he's against, and you notice that he rejected my challenge. Instead, he resorted to the same kind of name calling, the same kind of, of uh, distortions of fact that we've seen for the last 18 months in his negative ads. Now on the issues that really affect the people of this state, I think the choice is very clear. Will you elect a senator who will fight for independence and a secure retirement for our parents and grandparents, or a senator who's voted time and again to cut the benefits they've earned? Will you elect a senator who fights for fair treatment for our hard-pressed taxpayers, or a senator who has fought for special tax breaks for the wealthy and for the big oil companies? We elect a senator who stands for better schools and economic opportunity for our children, or one who opposes vocational education and college loans for middle class families. These are the choices that we face, and you will make the decision. And now, gentlemen, it's time for the first question. This question from Mr. Hunt to Mr. Helms, and I quote, Senator Helms, three million Americans, many of them elderly widows, receive the minimum Social Security benefit of $122 a month. Yet you voted three times to eliminate the minimum benefit, even for those who were already receiving it. How can you justify ever voting to take the minimum benefit away from these people? Governor, you and Mr. Mondale are just trying to scare our senior citizens. You do this every election, and it's just not right. Now, in 1982, your political advisor, your pollster, Mr. Peter Hart, boasted after the election that his campaign strategy was to peddle fear about Social Security. And he brazenly admitted that he had demagogued the issue just to help liberals like yourself gain political office. Now, when questioned on a national TV show about whether he had used fear tactics and demagoguery to scare senior citizens, your advisor, your pollster, Mr. Hart, arrogantly replied, and I quote, I plead guilty, and how about that? Well, how about that, Governor? Maybe you ought to take a minute to explain to our senior citizens why you hired a pollster who admits that his strategy is to scare our senior citizens, and that's precisely what you're doing with a question like that. We had a tough problem in the Senate trying to save the Social Security system. You didn't have that. All you had to do was issue press releases and write letters and make promises. But we had the obligation to try to bring some sanity to that program. Now, I think that the people of this state know that your positions are based on political polls, and it comes as no surprise to me, Governor, that you are taking your pollster's advice and trying to scare the elderly of this state. You brought in uh, Claude Pepper not long ago. And I was very interested in the High Point Enterprise editorial, said he was a master of fright, master of fright. And for once, uh, the High Point Enterprise hit it right on the head, and I suggest you read that editorial and take a look at what you're doing. And I say again to the elderly, the senior citizens of North Carolina and elsewhere, nobody in Washington, D.C., Democrat, Republican, Independent, or whatever, has any notion of doing any harm to our senior citizens. We do have to cast some tough votes. We can't get by with issuing press releases and writing letters like Governor Hunt has done. Now, Senator, I noticed that you didn't look the older people in the eye tonight and tell them you didn't vote against the $122 minimum three different times, because you did. On July the 21st, 1981, July the 31st, 1981, and September the 24th, 1981, I've got the roll call votes right here. Now what that means is that an elderly widow who perhaps never worked outside of the home or a World War II veteran who's making $301 a month getting it from some other source couldn't receive the $122 minimum in Social Security. I think that vote is just absolutely wrong. And at the same time, you're denying them that little bit of help that they need so desperately. You're voting for those big tax breaks for the big oil companies, the big chemical companies, your friends putting so much money into your campaign. You're a senator who cuts some time and again, I'll go to Washington to protect those programs. Governor, as I said at the outset, you have flip-flopped all over the lot on issue after issue, including this one. 
Now, I'm amazed to hear you make the statement, including Social Security. I want to remind you, sir, that at the 1983 National Governors Conference, you yourself took a position opposing the Social Security bill, the same bill that you've been criticizing me about. So there you go, flip-flopping again. Another time you said you had no position on it. Now, of course, you claim to be for this and for that, that you're a promising politician and you're going to promise everything to everybody. But the worst part of your posturing on this issue is that you're using the politics of fear. That's a cruel hoax, Governor, and I thought better of you. Gentlemen, it's time for the next question. This question from Mr. Helms to Mr. Hunt. Should any president or any governor be allowed to violate the law for four years without the taxpayers being protected by a special prosecutor to examine the facts and take appropriate action? Would you agree to the appointment of a special prosecutor to investigate your admitted violations of state law including the $185,000 you have confessed to involving the misuse of state planes, helicopters, automobiles, and state employees for your political purposes. I have not misused any state property at all. Now, I've, I've been very open about this whole thing. I paid uh, un until the time that I began my campaign, I paid the cost of the aircraft we used according to state law and the directions of the Director of Elections in North Carolina. Now, Jesse, this past Friday, after we had a, an outside order to come in and do the calculations, I paid to the state of North Carolina $185,000 for the use of the state aircraft during my campaign. Incidentally, that's more than uh, President Reagan pays for his own use of Air Force One. We paid at the highest rate that we could possibly pay. Now, I've opened my books. I would challenge you to do the same thing. You've raised millions of dollars in your campaign through both your campaign committee and your national congressional club. Your TV ads are produced and paid for by an organization controlled by your political lieutenants called the Jefferson Marketing Corporation. A number of legal questions have been raised as to whether Jefferson Marketing has been used to disguise violations of campaign spending laws and to provide cut rate advertising costs in your campaign. And the FEC has been looking into this, I think, for about two years. Now, you could answer those questions, Senator, by ordering your political lieutenants to open the books of Jefferson Marketing for public inspection. We figured up some some undercharges and paid the state of North Carolina. I want to urge you and challenge you tonight to open the books of Jefferson Marketing and direct your lieutenants who are sitting right here in this studio tonight to open those books and let the public know what's going on in your political empire. I'll give you five seconds to ask my, answer my question, yes or no, about the special prosecutor, yes or no. For once, answer a question, Governor. You don't have to answer no, a question. No, Mr. When, Moderator, when, I, I when don't There's no any more reason time. for it. I told you, Jesse. So your answer is no. That I, that Mr. I had. Mr. Moderator, charge that time to him. Jesse, I told you uh, Mr. that Moderator, I had paid for the use of those aircraft. Mr. Helms. So I take it to your answer is no. There is no reason for that. I didn't ask you Senator that. Senator Helms, and no prosecutor has suggested that. Well, and I you know it full well. You're grandstanding here tonight. It's exactly no, what no. you're doing. No, you're, you're ducking the issue. And I expected All that. All right. I hope I have a minute, uh, Mr. Moderator. Governor, for four years, you've been telling the people of North Carolina that you were paying the full cost. But in July, it was revealed that you had paid only $200 for an $1,100 an hour helicopter. Now, I can't believe that you think you can continue to hide your political activities from the people of North Carolina in light of your having been forced to admit, and you were forced, you weren't voluntary about it, forced to admit that you used $185,000 in tax money for your campaign. What else do you have to hide, Governor? Now, Governor, if you refuse to level with the people, if you refuse to agree to the appointment of a special prosecutor, will you at least agree to make available to the Wake County Superior Court in the lawsuit now before that court all records relating to your having used tax funds in your political campaign? And will you agree to make available personnel in your office at the Department of Commerce, your campaign, including Mr. Pell, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Grimsley, and yourself for immediate questioning? And will you advise the presiding judge that you wish 
This to be considered Gentlemen, as we call time. Very well. Now, Senator, you've laid out all of this stuff, which I knew was coming from you tonight, because David Flaherty has been grandstanding on this, and I know he filed a lawsuit at your suggestion. Now, I have told you that we've been very open. We have paid every cent. As a matter of fact, they tell me we paid $80,000 more than we would have paid if we'd used commercial aircraft. So we've opened the books, we paid what we owe, and that's the way I believe that we ought to do business. Now my question to you, you never responded to. What about your congressional club and Jefferson Marketing? There was an allegation last week and a complaint filed with the FEC that they have made about $400,000 of illegal contributions to your campaign. Now I ask you again, Will you open those books? Here are the two men who headed up. They're the only stockholders of Jefferson Marketing. Will you tell them tonight to open it up and let the press look at it? Do you yield time for me to answer the question? Five seconds, Mr. Moderator. Yes five or no? Five seconds, sir. Well, I can't answer it in five seconds, but uh, I'll, I'll answer it on the next go around. All right, sir. This next question is from Mr. Hunt to Mr. Helms. On July 23rd, 1982, you voted for a $100 billion tax increase, the biggest tax hike in American history. It hit hardest at working people through higher telephone taxes, higher Medicare fees, higher unemployment taxes, and higher cigarette taxes. Senator Helms, why did you choose to vote for higher taxes on working people when the wealthy and special interests who contribute to your campaign are not paying their fair share? Mr. Moderator, I've answered that question over and over again, and I'll say to the governor again, as he should know, that that bill was a loophole closing bill. And you may remember in the second debate, the governor had all this to say about, I'm going to close loopholes. You said you wanted to close loopholes, and that's what was done in that 1981 bill. And that's what I tried to tell you in the last debate. But the $217 billion tax increase bill that you voted for, you raised your hand in Washington, D.C., called for instituting a 5% increase in taxes over five years. Now, after we've closed all these loopholes, your plan still calls for increasing taxes 40 to $50 billion a year. And you can't get that from loopholes, Governor. It will have to be taxed away from the pocketbooks of the average American people. And that's what you've done here in North Carolina. You've raised a gas tax, you've raised a sales tax, you've raised the taxes on driver's licenses, auto plates, and all these taxes and others hit the middle class the hardest. In fact, you presided over the two largest tax increases in North Carolina history, the 1981 gas tax, which you referred to as just a little bit for our roads, was actually the largest tax increase in North Carolina history. But you topped that in 1983, Governor, with an even larger tax increase. Now, as you know, most of those taxes that I mentioned earlier were part of the 1983 tax package, and you deny supporting that package. But let's see what the Charlotte Observer, for example, had to say about your position on the tax bill. It said, Governor Jim Hunt entertained 14 legislators at dinner Wednesday night to help them close the gap between the House and Senate versions of a major tax increase. And while publicly maintaining his aversion to new taxes, Governor Hunt offered behind the scenes help uh, to the lawmakers that they might need to get a compromise. You have a one minute uh, Thank you, sir. response, <clears throat> Mr. Hunt. Jesse, the only taxes that I have supported have been taxes to save the roads in North Carolina. Now, with regard to your vote to raise the $100 billion, that was the largest tax increase in history. You said it was a loophole closer. Well, it certainly didn't close very many loopholes. And by the way, back in 1981, if you closed a few, I'm certainly glad, because in 1981, you had just opened the door for the whole stable, and the horses really came out. You gave the billions of dollars. You even gave the opportunity to sell tax write-offs. And you talked about me at the National Governors Conference. You've been running that ad. The people of this state know that 50 governors in America who go to Washington once a year for a couple of days have no authority to raise anybody's taxes. It was a vote to say to the Congress and the President, get the deficit down. The popular thing would have been to have voted no. I voted to get that deficit down, and that's what I think you all ought to do. 
You have a minute for a response, Mr. Heller. Well, let me go back to Jefferson Marketing. I want to say to the governor that if you will agree to the, the, to the special prosecutor, and you ought to want this, so that uh, the people can see the cloud removed from your head, if somehow it can be. I will agree to request my people to go and provide all of the information. Now, all you've got to say is, I want this thing cleared up. I'm willing to have a special prosecutor. I know I'm innocent. I know that uh, I was misunderstood when I said in July that uh, we were being fair in payment and all that sort of thing. So, Governor, if you will agree, I will agree. Well, now, Jesse, if you agree to a special prosecutor in Washington on your FEC violations, I'll agree to anything else. You want to agree to that? Well, we'll, we'll agree to anything to get you out in the open for once, Governor. And, and your violations over all of these you years? You say they're violations. We have had counsel, learned counsel, distinguished counsel telling us every step of the way that what we were doing is thoroughly legal. You have filed charges with the FEC, we have filed charges. Your filing charges doesn't make them so, our filing charges doesn't make them so. So, Governor, once more, will you agree to a special prosecutor? If you'll agree to one to your violations. Well, we'll see about that. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have, have any objection. I have to call time on Moderator. this area again and get on to the next question. Good. This is a question from Mr. Helms to Mr. Hunt. The Charlotte News described you in San Francisco as follows. Quote, first Geraldine Ferraro, Ted Kennedy, then Walter Mondale. Three powerful speeches, three shining examples of the Democratic Party. The whole evening was emotional. After each speech ended, many members of our delegation, including the usually reserved Governor Jim Hunt, jumped in our seats and swayed in time to celebration. Is this account of you in San Francisco accurate? Mr. Moderator, I'm glad we got this question because throughout these debates, and if you folks have noticed, instead of talking about his record, instead of talking about what he's for, instead of talking about what he wants to see happen in America over the next several years to make our life better, Senator Helms keeps trying to run me down. And the number one thing he's trying to do in this campaign is to paint Jim Hunt as a, quote, Mondale liberal. Jesse, I guess if you took those two words out of your vocabulary, even you would be speechless. Well, the truth is, people know different. People know that I'm supporting uh, Fritz Mondale for president, and that may not be popular now. But I'm a Democrat, and the Democratic Party has historically stood for people. But I'm a person who would go to the Senate to vote independently. I won't tow anybody's party line, and I certainly won't be a handmaiden of some of the special interests in the way that you voted with them every time up and down the line to get tax breaks, to uh, uh, get special treatment with regard to the regulations and the environmental regulations in this country. I'm part of a new generation of Democrats that we know here in the South. People like Chuck Robb and Dick Riley and Sam Nunn and the Governor Bob Graham in Florida. People who believe in three things. Number one, they believe in balanced budgets. Number two, they believe in economic growth and providing jobs for people. And number three, they believe in racial justice and people working together. Now those are the things that I subscribe to. I will go to Washington to fight for those things, regardless of who's president. This race is between Jim Hunt and Jesse Helms, and the people of this state know Jim Hunt because I've been an official for them for the last 12 years. Mr. Helms? Well, I think the people of North Carolina know Jesse Helms as well, and that's your problem, Governor. Now, I know you're denying it, and I know that you don't like to be, have your name linked with Fritz Mondale. But the record shows that you've been full of praise all along for these liberals. Uh, Kennedy, Mondale, Farrar. You were one of the few North Carolinians who enthusiastically cheered Mondale's selection of Farrar. The Charlotte Observer said that you praised Representative Farrar as saying that she was, quote, eminently qualified to serve this country in the highest capacity, quote, unquote. And back in 1980, when Ted Kennedy made that speech, you said he really put in perspective what we're all about here and what this party's about. I don't think many Democrats agree with you on that. And of course, you have repeatedly praised Walter Mondale. 
Now, Mr. Mondale once boasted that he had the most liberal voting record in the Senate, yet in a 1982 fundraising letter from Mr. Mondale, you said he has served us well during his many years in the United States Senate. So I think it's fair to assume that uh, you have supported you, these three figures. I know you don't want to hear about it, but so, so be it. Oh, yes. Mr. Hunt, I want to hear all you've got to say. Good. You have as a minute a, to respond. As a matter of fact, Jesse, I want to in issue an invitation to you tonight. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro is coming to Raleigh on October the 1st, and I want to invite you to come. I think you would really enjoy a very spunky lady who's running for vice president. Now, you're a fine one to be talking about supporting the president, as you've done throughout this campaign. According to the Congressional Quarterly, you were second lowest in supporting President Reagan's program of all 55 Republicans in the Senate. The only person in the Senate who supported the president less than you did was your friend, Lowell Weicker of Connecticut. You oppose the president on saving Social Security. You opposed him on education cuts you wanted to cut deeper. You've opposed him on foreign affairs, the Falcons, El Salvador, and last week on the Genocide Treaty. I'd say you haven't been a very good supporter of your president. It's time now to move on to one more question of the prepared questions. This one from Mr. Hunt to Mr. Helms. Senator, you have voted to cut the student loans that help working people afford a college education for their children. And you have said that the federal government should end all aid to education. Do you really think it is fair to deprive middle-class kids of the same educational and job opportunities that wealthy people enjoy? There you go again. Mr. Moderator, uh, time and time again, he phrases and couches his language in that fashion. Let me tell you something, Governor. The people of North Carolina in 1972 elected me to go to the United States Senate to cut federal spending. I voted that way, and uh, somebody totaled up, and uh, they found that I had knocked off at least $100 billion worth of spending. They reelected me in 1978 because they knew that I would vote and work to reduce federal spending. Now, Governor, I have been all over the Capitol alone. You and looked at the trees out there, and there's not a one that produces money. Now, you sit down here and you issue press releases and write letters, and you got more press secretaries than uh, Carter had little liver pills, but uh, uh, that is not responsive to the needs of this country. What we need is to cut federal spending, return the control of education to the state and local governments where it once belonged and where it flourished, and get the federal bureaucrats out of it. What we have now is tax money going to Washington, being funneled into that bureaucracy. They scoop off about 60% of it and then send some of it back. Now, you, in, you, you favor federal aid to education. I claim that it has been an abject failure. But I say again that I'm proud of my record of trying to cut spending across the board, and I've done a pretty good job of it. Now, as far as not supporting Mr. Reagan, I saw that deceptive little analysis, that 41% of not supporting him. That consisted of an analysis of 36 votes out of something like 500 votes that I cast. 500. And I want to list 20 of those votes, or those 36 votes, and see how you would have voted. I won't have time right now, but we're going to get back to it because I want to pin the tail on the donkey. I want to see how you would have voted in the cases where I voted. Mr. Hunt, do you have a minute to respond to that? What, what about college loans, Jesse? Did you forget the question? I asked you about college loans. You must not have heard what the question was, but let me go ahead and take my minute here. Because this, I think, really shows the kind of priorities you have. And it certainly doesn't include college young people whose families really need some help, especially the middle class taxpayers, because it takes a lot to send a young person to college. You have voted time and again and again. I've got your votes here. June the 24th, 1981, March the 31st, 1981, back August the 16th, 1978. And in the last debate, you did say you wanted to get the federal government completely out. That would have meant we couldn't have had a GI Bill that so many of our people went under, and it would mean that 20,000 North Carolina college students would have to drop out of college. 
I think college is one of the best investments we can make. It will help us compete economically throughout this world. You have a minute to respond, Mr. Helms. I say again that we need to get the federal government out of it because, Governor, you've been down here as governor 12 years, and if you don't know about the private loans available to college students, and if you don't know about your responsibility to work in that connection, then something is amiss. You've been campaigning more than I thought you had. But I still say it, I believe most of the parents and a great many of the teachers whom you have jerked around on this pay raise thing, by the way, I believe they understand and they agree with me that the worst thing that ever happened was letting the federal bureaucrats get their nose under the tent and start controlling education. And I think you could track the graph all the way down and it began, Mr. Moderator, when people like Governor Hunt turned over the educational responsibility to the federal government. Let me now pose the final of the prepared questions, this question from Mr. Helms to Mr. Hunt. When Senator Mondale voted to increase spending 74% of the time, you said Mondale served us well. When Carter and Mondale increased taxes and spending 73% of the time, you said they were leading us in the right direction. After Mondale pledged to raise taxes to pay for his $90 billion in new spending, you said he was fiscally responsible. Do you stand behind your statements in support of Mondale? And Jesse, I've answered this question once, but just to make sure that you understand it, I want to answer it again. My proposal for dealing with the federal budget deficit that huge problem that you all up there have gotten us into is not to raise taxes. I think we should first of all cut spending, and I think you know full well that I've laid out a plan that I'm committed to, to vote to cut the deficit 80 to $100 billion the first year I'm in the, in the Senate. So the first thing is to cut spending. The second thing we ought to do is to get some tax revenues from people who aren't paying their fair share. And that means cutting out some of the tax loopholes, some of those uh, tax giveaways that you and some of your friends have been doing up for the big oil companies, the big chemical companies, the big mining companies, the big utility companies. The taxpayers of this state and this country know what's been happening to them, and they know they've been paying more than their fair share. So I think we ought to cut those loopholes and take away some of those tax shelters and get some more money from those people who ought to be paying. Then we could get the deficit down. Again, in 1979, you voted for tax advantages for the big oil companies in the amount of $227 billion. Now, a lot of people don't understand how much money that is. With that much money, you can run the state of North Carolina for 38 years. And then you came along in 1981 and voted for another 60 billion. So you've been, in effect, giving away the tax money that people ought to be paying, which would help us to keep that deficit down. So I'm opposed to raising taxes. You know it full well, and the people of this state know it full well, and your efforts to try to deceive them about where I stand won't wash. I've submitted eight balanced budgets, and that's more than President Reagan has done. Well, you didn't answer the question, uh, but that's all right. I have voted yes, and I am proud of it, for the rigging economic recovery program. That was a part of it. And uh, apparently what you want is to return to the Mondale Carter years of gasoline lines, high gasoline prices. Governor, you cannot tax a corporation. I've said that before, and I hope you'll think about it and tell me how in the world you can tax a corporation. But what you're saying is, pass it along, pass it along to the consumer. Pass it along to the consumer with higher gasoline prices. But, but uh, you didn't answer about Mondale, and you have a pretty good habit of pushing your friends aside for your own political gain. That's pretty well known here in Charlotte. But the record shows, even though you don't want to talk about it, is you've been a longtime supporter of Walter Mondale. You raised money for him. You praised his record in the Senate. You work with the labor unions to get him nominated president. So I'll answer the question for you. And you I have think, a minute to respond. Sir. And I think that Walter Mondale has made some mistakes. And I think he's, he's wrong right now in pushing to increase taxes at the national level. I don't think that's necessary. 
And if he becomes the president and I'm in the Senate, I will vote against him on that. I will vote what I think is right for the people of this state and the people of this country. There are other ways to do it. Some of you folks up there, it seems to me, Senator, just don't understand about cutting here, cutting there, trying to tighten things up. That's what we had to do in North Carolina during the recent recession. We had a deep recession here. One out of every 10 people were out of, out of work, and we knew how to cut. And I'm the one who led the state in doing that. And so that's the approach we've got to take. And it won't be helped by your suggestion tonight that we ought to take off all the corporation taxes. What are you going to do, turn around and put that much more burden on the hardworking middle income taxpayer? I have to call time, gentlemen. That concludes the segment of prepared questions. The next segment of our format calls for the candidates to engage in a direct exchange of questions, answers, and rebuttals, and Mr. Helms will ask the first question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Governor, during our second debate, you were nervously evasive about Mather Slaughter, the man you put on the state payroll to spy on, on sheriffs in 1980. Now, in July, the Greensboro Record reported that you were paying Mr. Slaughter $25,000 a year to do nothing. And Mrs. Slaughter, Mrs. Slaughter said you were paying her husband $25,000 a year to, do, to keep him quiet. Now, after the Greensboro Record reported in July of this year that you were paying Slaughter to do nothing, you denied knowledge of the situation involving Mr. Slaughter. But, Governor, I have a, an article here showing that Mr. Slaughter was doing nothing to earn his pay. And here's another one. The headline says, uh, Mystery Shrouds Duties of Mather, of Mather Slaughter. And here's another article from June 1983 saying that you were paying uh, Mather Slaughter to do nothing. Now, Joe Pell and Brent Hackney, they knew all about it. How come you didn't know anything about it, Governor? Do you still say that Mrs. Slaughter was not telling the truth? I certainly do, Jesse. And by the way, after, after you talk so much and so glowingly about to Mr. Slaughter, I checked him out. And I found out that he's doing safety work. I answered it last time. I answered it again. Now let's get on to something important. Do you have any response, Mr. Helm? Well, I'm, I, I just simply say that uh, Mr. Hackney, Mr. Pell knew about it. Uh, we checked out all of these alleged responsibilities. First, you said he was doing some national defense work. We checked out on that, and that was not so. Then uh, we checked out the other things. And finally, we got a report from your own state ports authority that Mr. Slaughter was sitting down there looking at the water. Now, uh, maybe you've straightened it out since the last debate, and uh, if so, uh, that's an accomplishment for the debate. No, uh, you, uh, Jesse, I just uh, was informed by Admiral Green, who's executive director of the Ports Authority. He told me the man was doing safety work. Why don't you call him tomorrow and check? What kind of safety work? Safety for your campaign? <laughs> I think it's uh, time now to go on to the next question, and this time it's uh, a question from Mr. Hunt to Mr. Helms. <laughs> Senator, North Carolinians have always been willing to serve their country in the military. And I believe that we ought to honor our veterans. A North Carolinian, Billy Ray Cameron, is now serving as the national commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. But you, Senator, have called veterans' benefits welfare. And you have voted against funds for veterans' pensions and medical care for nine years running. You've tried to cut retirement and disability benefits for veterans. You've even voted for cuts that could force some VA hospitals and clinics to shut down entirely. How could you justify those votes against our veterans? Haven't cast any votes against the veterans, and if you think the veterans of North Carolina or any other state or people who sit around looking for things from Washington, D.C., you're wrong. They want a strong, reliable uh, government that operates physically responsibly. Now, if all that is so, Governor, how come it is that the Veterans of Foreign Wars has endorsed me for the United States Senate race? They didn't endorse you because they know one thing about you, that you'll say one thing here and one thing there and you'll flip-flop all over the lot. But they've been dealing with me for a long time. I've gotten every award that the Veterans of Foreign Wars just about has offered, the American Legion, right down the line. 
And it's uh, sort of an absurdity for you to suggest that these veterans are sitting out there saying, we want more from Washington. What they want is a stable government. They want a fiscally responsible government. They want a president like Ronald Reagan, who is bringing recovery to this nation. They don't want your kind of economic philosophy. Now, Jesse, I can see that you're really bothered by this question, oh. and by golly, you ought to be, because you have been calling it welfare. Let me, let me read you. You enjoyed reading some clips to me the other night. Let me read you one from the Charlotte Observer, January 27, 1978. It may be something of a surprise for the crippled war veteran who survives on a disability pension, but Senator Jesse Helms considers him a welfare recipient. Now, I've got every single one of your votes right here, Senator. You can't fool me, and I don't think you're going to fool the people of North Carolina. You don't want the one and a half, the, the one half million veterans and their families to know how you've been voting against them, and they really don't know about that. But they need to know the truth. You can't be for a strong defense and not be willing to treat the veterans who have fought our wars honorably. The difference between us is I'd vote to protect and to continue their benefits, and you voted to cut them time after time. Response? Governor, which war did you serve in? I did not serve in a war, okay. Senator Helms. All right, all right, and wait just a minute no, since no, you no, asked that question. Mr. President, when he I, answered, he I answered. was in college, Mr. Moderator, during uh, the time of the Korean War, oh, and I was too old with two children when Vietnam came along. And I don't like you challenging my patriotism, Senator. I haven't challenged your patriotism. Yes, you have. You know exactly what that question no. was, was calculated to do. Well, I just wondered. Uh, you, you still know. have a minute, Mr. Helms. Ah, uh, thank you. In the first place, that Charlotte Observer column referred to what I was describing, transfer payments. I was itemizing all of the money that is taken from the taxpayers to Washington and then transferred to citizens across the spectrum. Uh, obviously, I took the figures from the budget. Uh, there was no implication that, uh, that I was opposed to veterans' benefits. Of course, I'm not. But I say again, Governor, and I wish you'd look at me instead of looking down. I say again that the veterans of North Carolina, they don't want the federal government looking after them. They want a strong, stable government. And that's the reason they're supporting Ronald Reagan, and that's the reason they're supporting me. We'll move on to the next question at this time. And uh, Mr. Helms, a question from you to Mr. Hunt. Governor, I uh, got to go back to your campaign because that's about all you've been doing for the last two years. You went up to New York and were wined and dined by some of the leading liberals in the country. Uh, Lightning Brown was there and uh, Virginia Puzo and various others. They raised money for your campaign and you held similar functions with liberals in Massachusetts and California and Minnesota and other places. And I was surprised in our first debate when you suddenly declared that I'm a conservative. Jim Hunter conservative? Well, Zeno Ponder, one of your close political associates, said flat out that you're not a conservative. And how do you explain Locke Faircloth, who was your Secretary of Commerce for six and a half years, and a doggone good guy, by the way. He declared that you're a liberal, and he knows you pretty well, Governor. Former Governor Bob Scott said that you, quote, definitely are the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, end of quote. The president of the state NAACP says that you represent a liberal type of governor, Time and yet you're question. pretending to be a conservative. Why do you think these fellows all said that kind of thing about you? Well, why are they all supporting me, you reckon? Well, you, you tell me. You talk about how good, uh, what a fine fellow Locke Faircloth is. He's not for you. He's for me. I put him in as Secretary of Commerce, and we brought more jobs into North Carolina, despite what you said the other day, we had a lot of plants close in large measure because you all in the Congress didn't protect American jobs. But in terms of bringing new jobs into this state, we've brought in, we've had more investment and brought in new, more new manufacturing jobs than other states have done. Now, Senator, uh, it's, this again is the whole approach that you're using. And I think the people of North Carolina understand what you're doing. I think they're looking for us to lay out what we want to do in this country where do we want to take America? What are our goals, our dreams, our vision for the future? I've been laying mine out. 
and you don't do a bit of that, we don't know what you're going to do in the next six years. I think we ought to be talking about that kind of thing. I've been trying to do it. And I really believe deeply, Senator, that's what the people of this state expect us to do in this campaign. You have response time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's very interesting to hear you say that you've been laying out what you're going to do. All I've heard you say is that you, you're going to raise taxes 40 to $50 billion. You're going to close loopholes when there are not any productive loopholes left, that sort of thing. I've heard you try to pretend to be a conservative. I've heard you uh, say uh, now tonight that you don't agree with Walter Mondale. Well, uh, we got to look back and see what the labor unions and Jim Hunt did to orchestrate the nomination of Walter Mondale. Uh, Governor, th the problem I have with you, and I've been surprised about it, is that you're all over the lot. You're one thing today, you're another thing tomorrow. And uh, the people know that. They know about the flip-flop, the windshield wiper. And you stand up and make all of these political speeches, but you haven't really talked about any issues. You reached in and found one vote out of 6,000 and said, back in 1978, you did so and so. Well, I've been up there casting votes. I think I've cast 9,000 uh, if you count the committee votes. But uh, you don't have to answer anything like that time. Thank you, sir. You have a minute to uh, respond, mm -hmm. Mr. Hunt. Now, uh, Jesse, you said you didn't know what I proposed to do. If you don't know that, you haven't been listening. Yes, I have. Because I've laid out specifically in some seven or eight issue papers what I think we ought to be doing in this country. Number one, I believe we need to have strong, vigorous economic growth with plenty of jobs for our people, especially here in the South, where we've generally been behind on those things. We've got to reduce the deficit so those interest rates will come down. That's one of the main things we've got to do. Second, we've got to do a better job of education in this country. Not all of that needs to be led from Washington, but Washington ought to have an interest in it. We need to have our young people learn more than they do in any other country in the world, and I think that's one of the things I can help give leadership to. Third, I'm interested in seeing that our parents and grandparents have a decent life and a decent future, and I want to work for that, and I want to work to protect the environment of this country. Now, those are the kinds of things that perhaps you ought to address in this campaign. Moving on, it's time for another question. This time, the question from Mr. Hunt to Mr. Helms. Senator, the nation's Medicare system is facing a crisis similar to that that was faced last year by Social Security. Next year, the Senate must take urgent action to save this program, which provides health care for older people. Now, you voted in the past to cut medical benefits and to require our parents and grandparents to pay hundreds of dollars more out of their own pockets. How do you propose to keep Medicare on a sound financial footing without unfairly increasing the medical bills that the elderly people of this state and this country have to pay? Mr. Helms. Governor, I'll tell you that uh, trying to uh, stabilize all of these uh, senior citizens programs is the biggest project before Congress today. I'm working with Bob Dole and the Finance Committee. I was talking to Russell Long about it. He has uh, problems about which way to go. But here again, you have the posture of a candidate who said, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend the money but you never say where you're going to get the money. And what you're saying uh, to the senior citizens is, uh, listen to me and I'll, I'll promise you everything because I'm a promising politician. But what you're also saying to the young workers in the workforce, to the middle-aged workers even, that we're going to jack up the taxes on you. And I said uh, in uh, one of the earlier debates that one of the fears, one of the forecast is that if we don't approach this thing sensibly and not cast political votes such as you say you're going to cast, if we don't face them responsibly, then the Social Security, all this tax will consume 40 percent of the average worker's income sometime shortly after the turn of the century. Now, it's easy enough, Governor, to promise and say, I'm going to look after you. But, and we are going to look after in some way. But we don't have any magical solutions, and neither do you. And I'll say again, Governor, that there's not a single money tree there in Washington, D.C. Well, Senator, I would imagine that the older people of this state 
are wondering right now how you are looking after them. Because you voted to increase the premiums they have to pay under Medicare, you voted to increase their co-payments, you voted to increase the deductible so that they have to pay more. Medicare used to pay the great part of their bills, and now it's gotten down to where it's only 45%. Jesse, I've been in those senior citizen homes. I've talked to those people. They've told me how little they have and how much their medical bills are taken out of it. And I really wish that maybe you'd visit some of them and listen to some of those, some of those people tell you how they feel. I think we've got to save Medicare, and the difference is you'll vote to cut the older people, and I'll vote to put the hospitals on a budget, require greater efficiency, and that way not have to cut the older people. Mr. Moderator, let me reclaim the 30 seconds that I gave no, up no. just now. Now, you have a minute to respond right well, now, sir. All right. Governor, on the Social Security question, I have been to the senior citizens' homes. I've probably been more to more of them than you have. I, we, I haven't counted. But do you know that we have handled over 40,000 uh, problems that our senior citizens have had? Now, they know me. They, they also know that there's a financial problem with the Social Security system. You're sitting and standing and smiling like you think there is no problem. But if you think there's a magic wand you can wave, you're not fooling them and you're not fooling anybody else. You can promise anything you want to, but I will say again that this senator is going to work to have a program that not only will look after the senior citizens, but remember that those senior citizens have children and grandchildren, and they want there to be a, to call time a, a Social Security system when they reach the retirement age. Mr. Helms, the next question is yours. With President Reagan leading Mr. Mondale two to one in the polls, Mr. Hunt refused to interrupt his vacation to greet Mr. Mondale when he came to North Carolina. But I don't think he's fooling anybody. The governor has been a close political ally of Walter Mondale for years and years, and I, I want to look at that record. And I think it's important since the governor is now all of a sudden saying he's a conservative. Now, the governor, at the behest of his labor union allies, set up the delegate selection rules to favor Walter Mondale. And I was talking to Gary Hart about this the other day in the cloakroom, guaranteeing that Mondale would win the Democratic nomination for president over Gary Hart. It worked. And the editor of the Charlotte Observer acknowledged that Mr. Hunt was responsible for Mr. Walter Mondale's early momentum. And the governor wrote a letter raising money for Mr. Mondale's drive for the president. And he praised Mondale's liberal record in the Senate, saying he has served us well during his many years in the Senate. He praised Mr. Mondale's acceptance speech attacking Ronald Reagan time as a great speech. Again, and I'll continue gentlemen. this in just a minute. Mr. Now, uh, Senator, that's another one of your fine political speeches in the form of a question. Uh, by the way, in terms of those rules of the Democratic Party, uh, the question at the time we wrote the rules looked like it was going to be, would it be Senator Kennedy or Vice President Mondale? I suppose you would probably have preferred Senator Kennedy. But to answer your question, the real truth is the people of this state know that Jim Hunt is a Democrat and he's proud to be a Democrat. Ours is the party of the people that has done so many good things for the people of this country. It's also made some mistakes. And it's made some mistakes of overspending and of taxing too much. And let me just say that in 1981, had I been in the Senate, I would have voted to cut spending and I would have voted to cut taxes. But I would have cut them fairly and not in the kind of unfair way that you did. I would have spread some of that tax cut out to the average hardworking taxpayer in this country instead of giving so much of it to the big oil companies and the chemical companies and the mining companies and all the rest. Now, I am of a kind of Democrat, and I know that you're very worried that we have Democrats who are fiscally responsible. You'd like for all the Democrats to be some kind of super liberals. Well, we are not. And in the South throughout history, we have not been. Thomas Jefferson, let me remind you, Senator, is the father of our party, and we're very proud of that. And I'm a Democratic leader who's fiscally responsible, 
committed to economic growth and jobs, believing in people getting along and working together, and when I go to the United States Senate, I'll be that kind of senator. You have a minute to respond, Mr. Helms. You know, the governor does not realize, Mr. Moderator, that he has just concluded, again, implicitly attacking Ronald Reagan's recovery program. Now, the legislation that you've been talking about, that was part of the recovery program. And you, you, you back then said uh, it's, uh, you, you put all sorts of bad names on it. But it's worked. We've got more people working today than ever in the history of this country. There's an upbeat attitude, as I said at the outset of this debate. It's working. And as far as not liking uh, uh, this, uh, the conservative Democrats, there being so many of them, I love it because they are the ones who supported me in 72 and 78, and I think they're going to support me again in 1984. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to move along because time is moving very rapidly, and I'm going to have to call a conclusion to our questions and give each of you one minute for closing statements. And Mr. Hunt, you have the uh, move to present your closing statement first. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Let me say to the people of North Carolina that I appreciate you watching these debates. I know that, uh, especially when the football games are on, that uh, we have a lot of competition. But I think you are having a chance to look at both of us square in the face, not a 30-second commercial that's been put together on Madison Avenue, and get some feeling about what we're about. And I think that's the real issue here. Jim Hunt is about trying to make life better for people. I do favor trying to help our older people. My parents just had their 50th wedding anniversary, and I'm proud they get Social Security, and I'm proud they get Medicare. I want us to have better schools. I want us to have more jobs. I want us to protect our environment. Those are things that a senator ought to fight for for North Carolina, and I'll fight for them and against people that are ripping off this system. Mr. Helms, your one-minute closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you will decide in November what kind of future you want for America. And your choices will be clear in both the presidential race and in the Senate race in North Carolina. Now, I say again, Mr. Hunt is a Mondale liberal and ashamed of it, and I'm a Reagan conservative and proud of it. It's been a long time since the, this country has been so upbeat about the future. Americans are once again proud to be Americans, thanks to Ronald Reagan's courage and high principles, but it was Mr. Hunt, remember, who said, I have opposed what the Reagan administration is doing to this country. Now, Walter Mondale, as he has said tonight, is Mr. Hunt's man. Uh, Ronald Reagan is my man. Now, that's the measurement of your choice in November. If you support Mondale liberalism, uh, big spending and high taxes, you should vote for Jim Hunt and Walter Mondale, but I counsel you, Hunt and Mondale are wrong. But if you believe in the kind of future that Ronald Reagan and I seek for I America, call time. I hope you'll support the president and me because we need you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, our time is up. On behalf of broadcasters throughout North Carolina and our originating station, WSOC-TV, we thank you for participating in this important public service. Next debate is scheduled for October 13. Thank you and good night. This debate was brought to you as a public service by the broadcasters of North Carolina. Facilities were provided by WSOC-TV Charlotte.